going to, uh, tonight we're going to continue uh, in the book of uh, St. Matthew. We're going to be doing uh, Matthew chapter 3, chapters 3 and 4 tonight. Uh, we started out last week in chapters uh, 1 and 2, and we had a very uh, engaging discussion. And uh, so tonight we want to continue with St. Matthew chapter 3 and 4. I will read and then we will get into the lesson. Matthew chapter 3 says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our fathers. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto him to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou of me to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Praise the Lord Jesus. All right. So we're going to begin. Uh, John the Baptist came on the scene with a twofold message that he brought to uh, the Jewish community at that time. And this twofold message was that people needed to repent, which means they needed to turn away from their sins and return to God. Uh, again, re re repentance is a two-part process, to turn away from sin to, and to turn to God. And this was in preparation for the imminent coming of the kingdom of heaven. Um, it's, it's, again, it's vital that we understand it is not just to stop doing some things. Repentance is not just the end of your old life. It is the beginning of a new life. And so in verse 3, Matthew once again connects an ancient prophetic word with the events surrounding the coming of Jesus. All right. And it's about John the Baptist. So he quotes from Isaiah 40, verse 3. Remember last week we said that it's all about connection. Uh, Matthew is trying to make the connection uh, between the, the old and the new, the, the, the law and Moses and uh, uh, the coming of Jesus Christ and how Jesus fulfills many prophecies. That is the exact reason why we went from Deuteronomy to the book of Matthew, because it's important for us to make this connection. In Isaiah 40 and verse 3, uh, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We're talking about 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. We went into Jesus' birth in some detail last week. This prophecy was written uh, uh, book of Isaiah, again, some 700 years uh, before its fulfillment. So what we're reading in Matthew 
uh, Matthew is he wants the people to understand that what you're seeing before your eyes uh, in this person of John is the fulfillment of a 700 year old prophecy. Um, you know, I, 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 I've studied theology. I've, I've interacted with um, folks who have studied theology. And as many of you are aware, there are some doctrines that I am completely uh, against today. Again, deception is always uh, about 70 to 80 percent truth. And so I, I will not disregard everything that they say. However, if any doctrine that is only based upon church fathers, right, Clement, Origen, Augustine, Jerome, and, and, and so many more names that I could list, if those are the names that people uh, 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 revert to or rely on for their doctrine and it's not supported by Old Testament scripture, then those doctrines uh, uh, can be problematic. All right. So it's important for us to know our Bibles, know church history and understand all the information that's there. However, everything must point back to the scriptures. Remember, for Jesus and the apostles, the scriptures was the Septuagint. The Old Testament was their scriptures. All right. And so for us, it's important that we see the connection right, between the New Testament and the Old. That's what Matthew is doing. So he goes back to Isaiah and he's explaining to them that, or he wants them to understand that uh, um, uh, what, what John, th this John the Baptist is uh, fulfilling. Another scripture, Malachi 4 and verse 5, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, so, so here uh, Matthew wants uh, everyone to understand that John is fulfilling both Isaiah's prophecy and a prophecy uh, of Malachi. Malachi, we said, is the last book of the Old Testament and uh, would have probably written maybe some uh, four to five hundred years uh, uh, that would cover the period of time from that last prophetic book before Christ came. Now, he is called John the Baptist or John the Immerser, right? And for Jews to be immersed was meant in the same sense as one might dye a piece of cloth. Uh, you guys have heard me teach this extensively, right? That the word baptism comes from the D-Y-E, the dye trade. You know, many of us grew up learning about, you know, tie-dye, right? In school, it was probably part of the craft that you did. You dipped uh, the cloth in the, in the dye and it, and it would absorb the color and take on its characteristics. So you dip the cloth into the colored dye and when removed, it takes on the color of the dye. And that's what baptism is, right? If you're not taking on the qualities or the characteristics of what you've been baptized into, then you're not baptized. We're going to deal with baptism tonight. There are a few main topics we're going to deal with. But, uh, you know, many of us, we have uh, from our Western modern day view, and again, a lot of the theologians so-called have contributed to this erroneous perspective all right, but baptism uh, is essential and vital, and, and I'll explain that uh, uh, some more, right? So this dipping or absorbing was meant in a religious context, and for the Jews, it revolved around ritual purity. When, when we studied the Torah, right, nowhere in Leviticus uh, did it say that people were washed to remove sin. When we read about washing, if you remembered when we studied the lepers and those who had uh, uh, become unclean, uh, discharged from the body or, you know, some of the means, uh, they had to undergo washing and that was for ritual purity. So baptism or washing in water, right, which we know the priests had to do that before they entered into the tabernacle, 
It had nothing to do with cleansing of sin. All right. Uh, 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 now, uh, so when and, and, and this was practiced in Jesus's day when they had the temple, that whenever anyone went to offer a sacrifice, they first had to be immersed. Now, by the days of the temple, they didn't use the, the labor that we read, read about in the wilderness, but they were what was, what was called mikvahs or baths, right? That people would wash themselves in and they were located uh, on the temple grounds. So any Jew, including Jesus, right, who was a Jew, uh, uh, who was practicing Judaism would have uh, uh, would have uh, 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 experienced this washing in the mikvah, right? Which was what was symbolic of ritual purity. So they did this in obedience to 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 what we, what we studied in Levitic in Leviticus, right? Now immersion again is about ritual cleansing, right? From spiritual impurity <clears throat> for the for these jews as we studied <clears throat> excuse me in leviticus it was the sacrifice the blood that dealt with atonement right water never dealt with atonement it dealt with cleansing blood dealt with atonement right so what john is doing why john is offering something new is because john is combining the cleansing from the impurity with the uh, 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 with the atoning brought about through uh, 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 the, the 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 sacrifice, okay. So what John said is that this new immersion, this baptism that he was going to be performed, and why he was called the the baptizer, was not for cleansing from ritual purity, but cleansing from sin. Right. That is what John introduced. That was different. The Jews were accustomed to baptism. They didn't call it that. It was a, a, a ritual bath, right, that they had long conducted since Moses, right? But now what John was introducing was a new aspect to that. So please, in our minds, understand that impurity and sin are two different things. Impurity is not sin. We covered that in Leviticus. OK, so the remedy for impurity cost did not cost anything. You just washed and you were cleansed. Right. But the remedy for sin always involved sacrifice. Right. Impurity was cured with water. Sin was cured with the blood of an innocent animal. Now, it is not that the immersion in water itself atoned for sin. So even though John was introducing a new aspect to this, right, John always pointed them to someone else, right? He, he said, it's not, I'm not Elijah and I'm not the Messiah. John never accepted uh, uh, when people asked him, you know, they were, in, they were inquiring about his identity. John was always pointing them to someone else. So, you know, when you put your trust in the one I'm preparing the way for, right? So now he's saying the immersing in the water was symbolic of taking on the characteristics of the one who was coming, right? So that's what John uh, was baptizing them on to repentance for them to look forward to someone else. Now, the term baptize means to immerse. However, so many people who grew up Catholic, I had a conversation with someone uh, 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 this week who was, you know, Catholic and, you know, they are sprinkled at birth. Sprinkling is not baptism. The word baptize, it's it, the very word, it's etymology, means immersion. OK, so when the Catholic Church began to sprinkle people and call it baptism, there were folks who broke away. They revolted against that and they conducted baptism as it was originally intended. And that's where we get the name Baptists. So today, when you hear about Baptists, that is how that denomination arose. It is as, it is as a result of the breakaway from the Catholic practice of sprinkling and calling that baptism. 
So having a few drops of water flicked on you is not immersion and is not baptizing. Neither is the practice of baptizing infants or small children effective because they have no choice in the matter, right? People who were to be baptized had to have a consciousness of their sin, a consciousness of the option or the choice to accept God's salvific plan and to, for them to consciously make that choice. Obviously, you have to be someone of reasonable age, right? Okay, or at the age of account accountability. So for anybody who hears this, and if you were not immersed, right, then you were not baptized. Another term we, 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 that, that John used that we're going to talk about is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And when you read the other gospels, you will see the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of folks who think that they are different, but they are not. They mean exactly the same thing, right? Remember, we taught you that the Jews are very skeptic about using the word God, right? Today, when they want to talk about God, they use Hashem. We taught you that Shem means name, right? So they're very skeptic about using, so they don't say the kingdom of God. Remember, we taught you that Matthew is writing to the Jews. So predominantly in Matthew, you will see the term kingdom of heaven, Whereas in Mark, Luke, and maybe even in John, you will see kingdom of, but it means the same thing. All right. It's the concept of the ultimate restoration of God's creation. So in, in, in Genesis, which we covered uh, in Matthew chapter one, the generation of Jesus, Genesis, right? So this is a new beginning. In the book of Genesis, God created this paradise, this utopia, this beautiful place for man to live in. And Adam was not created to die. However, remember in the garden was the tree of life, which meant that Adam had access to even greater dimensions of life, right? However, he forfeited that by sinning, okay? And God, God's plan is to restore creation to its original, uh, his original plan, its original state. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, that's what it's all about. It's about God restoring humanity and eventually the world to its original state. That's what, why the book of Revelation is so important, because you're going to see how this process culminates. Okay, so uh, in Luke 17, verse 20, Luke 17, verse 20 says, when asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus says, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observable signs. Okay, it doesn't come with observable signs, right? Uh, 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 it doesn't come with observation. You, you don't, don't say lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of heaven is not a place or time, okay? It's not, a, it's not a place or a time. It's a state of being. It's a state of being whereby all has been restored to its original perfection. All is new and the entire universe is forever free from sin and death, all right? It is really a sad state that, majority of preachers today are not preaching about the kingdom of heaven, are not preaching about the kingdom of God, when that is the ultimate purpose why John the Baptist came and why Jesus came. When we get to Matthew 4, we'll see that that's the message that Jesus preached. And yet it is not the predominant message we hear today. Okay? So when the kingdom of God is finally and fully restored, all living beings, everything in existence will be glorifying God as the ruler over all things. There will not be this divided allegiance anymore. Satan will be bound. All his demons will be bound. And all who followed him, they all will be bound and cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says in Revelation 20 that this is the second death. And that's what we all should be trying to escape from, right? Because there is a, a total renovation that is going to take place, 
Okay? So John is the inaugurator. And John says, it is near, right? So this kingdom of heaven, it is now being introduced by John and it, 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 it grows. Daniel uh, speaks of it as this stone that was cut out of the, mount, cut out of the mountain that grew and eventually filled the, 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 the whole earth. So the kingdom of heaven is not a static thing. It, is, it, it, it began small. Jesus talked about uh, a small mustard seed is the smallest seed, but when it grows, it grows so big in describing the kingdom of heaven. Right. So when, when John says it's near, it's, he's not saying it's, pro, it's it's not talking about proximity since it's not a time or place. Right. But he's saying that the arrival of the state of being called the kingdom of heaven. Right. This this the stages of it is now closer to you. So his presence and ministry is the beginning of the stages in the kingdom of heaven that we, and he is there to prepare the way and announce the arrival of Jesus Christ who himself will ultimately usher in this kingdom of heaven so the kingdom of heaven began in a partial state of being and even now in us it is in a partial state right and until the devil and his minions are no more right and the new heavens arrive, this kingdom will always be in a partial state. In our day, being born again, this is how we now enter into the kingdom. That's what St. John 3 is about. We enter the kingdom of heaven by being born again, right? So uh, 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 currently within us, we can experience its goals, its hopes, its helps, right? Those of us who have been born again, we can choose to live holy lives that reflect the kingdom of heaven to the world, right? And, 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 and create the desire in others to want to be a part of us. That's why as Christians, we have to act different. We have to live by the spirit. That's what Jesus means when he says, let your light so shine, right? It can only be done by virtue of his spirit that is within us, which is the evidence that we belong to the kingdom of God, right? So, 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 uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we live holy lives and we reflect this kingdom by his spirit, right? Walking in obedience to him and waiting for the fulfillment and the ultimate completion. Praise God. Romans 8 says we, 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 we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to what? The, re the, 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 to re the redemption of our bodies, right? So we are all looking and longing for this. And if there's anybody under the sound of my voice who does not, who have not been born again or wants to understand more, please, you need to get in touch with us, okay? So in verse 4, John is described as having a garment of camel's hair and leather belt around his waist. If you look at 2 Kings verse 1 and 8, it says, they answered, and he's talking about Elijah. When you say uh, uh, um, uh, Isaiah, Elias, um, I'm sorry. In, 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 in Matthew 3, he says, um, the, well, Elijah, right? Elijah is who Matthew wants to compare uh, John with here. So if you read uh, 2 Kings 1, 8, it describes how Elijah was dressed. And Matthew here, again, wants to make that connection that John is this uh, reviving or resurgence of the prophet Elijah. So John in Matthew's, uh, uh, in Matthean the theology, right? This is the big word of, of talking about Matthew's teaching. Uh, is that John is essentially the new Elijah. So the common folks that lived in Jerusalem believed they were living in the end times. Why did all these people come to John to be baptized? Remember, they were under Roman oppression, right? And they were looking for a Messiah in the, in the, 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 the role of King David, right? A warrior, someone who was going to come and wage war and uh, deliver them from Roman oppression. 
So for, for the Jews living under, and, and please remember, we just studied how uh, 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 Herod ordered the, de the deaths of all the children two years and under. And we talked about how the very emperor of Rome said that it was better to be uh, Herod's uh, 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 pig than one of his children because he was so vicious. He killed his own children. So here these Jews were living in a very oppressive society and they were looking for deliverance. Any sign of salvation, they, they, they thought, you know, they would run to it. And remember, they, they understood the prophecies of Moses. So the people were fearful of this oppression. And so they came, they flocked to John. Again, they understood the, 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 the temple system and its corruption. Uh, uh, and they understood the synagogue system with the Pharisees, that it really did not relieve them from oppression. So they came to John to be baptized thinking again that here is Elijah, right? Verse 8, John says to the Pharisees and Sadducees, right, that I, I don't trust you. You, you, you don't, you, 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 your sincerity in your repentance doesn't seem genuine, right? Uh, they, caught, they came to confess and repent, but John says you need to bring, bring forth fruit. This is very important, folks, because it helps to teach us what repentance really is okay repentance must have evidence okay there must be evidence that you have rep repented there must be evidence of your faith this whole doctrine today that is being uh, 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 big word promulgated you know be being published being spoken of that so prominent right that you know just just believe and you're saved right there is no such thing in your Bible, folks. It might be in the 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 the, the part of the the, the so-called church fathers' doctrines and uh, a Greek philosophy will have such a doctrine, okay? But evidence of faith is what John required. It's what Jesus requires, and it is what the church should require. There must be evidence of faith. John seeks proof of sincerity. Right. And he tells them that if they as Jews, uh, 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 God was able to raise up stones, they shouldn't depend upon their heritage. Right. They needed to put sincere trust in God if they were going to be saved. Right. So if if we are if we say we are serving God and we are still doing the things of the flesh. Right. And still enjoying it. Some of us we do it, but we don't enjoy it because we're we're trying to grow out of it. But if you if you are uh, uh, find yourself practicing and habitually conducting and not desiring that change, then 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 your faith in God is doubt. Is, you should legitimately doubt your faith. Okay, the lack of evidence, right? should be an alarm to us whether or not we truly believe in God, okay? There must be evidence that you're truly trusting in God. And the evidence that John was wanted them to part part participate in is baptism, okay? So we'll talk more about how baptism becomes the evidence of your faith. In verse 10, John says to them, uh, that the insincere ones, those who are coming, pretending, and they might even get baptized. We will read in the book of Acts, right, of, 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 of Simon, right, who came and was baptized by Philip. But it was insincere. And John says that he uses the metaphor of an axe chopping down a tree, right, and this, the, the, this, the destruction of that tree with fire. So the tree represents someone, right, who uh, 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 there is no fruit in their life. There is no evidence in your life that you're trusting in God, right? It's, it's So the fruit of your life becomes a window to your character. Don't think that is what you put on, 
right? And how well you pray, right? That's not the, the, the full evidence that you're trusting in God. Anyone who in sincerity is putting their trust in God, they, their character will change. Your attitude will change. Your mind will change. Praise God. So, so, so it's in, that is the test, praise God, that we, we are truly uh, trusting in God. So fire in your Bible was always for two purposes, purification or destruction. Purification is to burn off the dross, right? But the core element remains intact and pure. But destruction, it removes the very existence of the thing. Same fire, two different results, right? So the, 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 the one who puts complete trust in God, the fire burns. But guess what? It burns off the dross, right? It cleanses, it purifies, while the one who is in, who is in, who is uh, insincere, same fire burns, but it destroys. Okay, so immersion in water is an expression of an already repentant condition. Please learn that tonight. Okay, right? Baptism unto repentance don't mean first you baptize and then you go repent. Right? Baptism is the evidence that you have repented. All right, it is. It is the. It expresses an already repentant condition. And let me just say this here, please. I want to get this on record. Right, for all the people who are trying to tell people that baptism doesn't have nothing to do with salvation, and you can just repent and and say forgive me and you're saved. If that was the case, then all the people who were baptized by John would be saved. See, that's the problem with that theology because ba John's baptism was unto repentance. Right? So if it is a mere repeating after some preacher and so-called repenting and you're saved, then everybody under John would not need to go to Jesus. Okay? I want to make sure we get that clear. See, this is just the fallacy and the foolishness that we hear that, you know, common sense should tell you something is wrong. Okay? So God places the faith within us. We've talked about that. That faith is a, 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 a sense of a sensory perception, a gift that God gives every man. Every man has faith that God gives you. However, okay, uh, 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 it is the faith that he gives us that enables us to repent. So, but until God through his word moves upon a man, he cannot repent. See, that's why the preaching of the word becomes so important. Faith cometh by hearing. So every man has been given a measure of faith, but it takes the word to activate that faith so that the man can repent. See, so when, when, when we ask you to teach a Bible study and to tell others about Christ, they already have one part of the equation. They have the, they have the innate faith that God gives them but it cannot be activated unless they hear the word. So when you go and you tell them about Jesus Christ and tell them about salvation, it activates the faith that God has, uh, has already given them. And so ultimately, God gets the glory. It's not the man who does it. It's God who gets the glory because he gave them the faith and he sends the word and he operates for their own salvation. Please understand that. Praise God. So John's, John calls for an immersion in water, which is a public profession of their repentance. Uh, uh, baptism is your public profession that you have repented. That's what baptism is. All right. But he says there's one coming after him, right, who will baptize them with fire. So the water was only symbolic. Remember, we tell you, water was never used for washing away sins. It was used for purification, right? It is only a symbol. It is their trust in the one who would come after John, the one he pointed to, who we know is Jesus Christ, and it is his blood. Jesus becomes the sacrifice. Remember we said, water purifies Blood cleanses, right? So by putting your trust in Jesus Christ, right? His blood cleanses you up from, from your sins. So the water is only symbolic. It is the external profession of the inward faith. 
But repentance alone don't save you. And water baptism alone don't save you. Oh my goodness, right? Immersion in the Holy Spirit is what actually saves you. Oh my goodness, please get that. Okay, it is the why because he says, notice he says he shall baptize you with what the Holy Spirit and what fire anything that fire touches, it changes. Okay, your house goes up in flames, it's not going to look the same. Your clothes go up in clay flames, it's not uh, fire changes anything that it touches. Praise God. And remember, we said the kingdom of heaven is a total renovation. So what the Holy Ghost comes in your life to do is to renovate you. That's why you can experience the kingdom of heaven within you because the Holy Ghost comes to change your nature even though on the outward you still look like the same old Joe or the same old Mary to everybody else. But on the inside, the fire of God through his spirit is changing your thoughts, changing your desires, changing your mind, right? Praise God. The, 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 the Holy Ghost is given uh, uh, for what we say regeneration. So you can't be saved without the Holy Ghost. Let's don't, don't let people fool you, folks. Okay, without the Spirit of Christ, we are. You don't. He doesn't even know you. Okay. So the the the, the, the repentance is the first step. Right, which is now I am declaring my trust in Jesus Christ. The water baptism is the evidence of that trust, okay? But you're not fully complete yet. That's why Jesus says you must be born of water and of the Spirit. But until you receive the Spirit, you can't have the nature of God. The Spirit of God is the nature of God, okay? So fire is used, we said, for what? Purification and destruction. So the fire of the Holy Spirit brings divine purification, stripping the person of uncleanness caused by the life of sinning and making them acceptable to God rather than remaining unclean and unacceptable to God. Okay? Thus suffering divine destruction will come, that, that thus suffering the divine destruction that will come to those who refuse the baptism. So if you refuse the baptism of the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're still going to get fire. <laughs> you got to get fire one way or the other. That's the point I'm trying to make. Either the fire comes by receiving the Holy Ghost, right? That burns out your carnal nature. Or by rejecting Christ, the fire comes and it burns up the total man, see? <laughs> okay? That is what we need to understand. That the, 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 what John was preaching was a baptism by fire that he, John, could not bring. I indeed baptize with water, but there cometh one, my goodness. Right? So true repentance followed by water baptism as evidence of our repentance prepares us for the Holy Spirit. That's why Peter could preach in Acts 2.38 when they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? He said what? Repent and be baptized. Every he was giving them the pattern. Praise God. So don't let no anybody tell you it's just Acts 2.38. No, we don't rely just on Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is the summers, summarization of the entire Bible. Okay, it is the summer. We give you the summary, but you can see Acts 2.38 from Genesis even to Revelation. Praise the Lord Jesus. All right. So again, I'm getting preachy there because I get excited. All right. So verse 12 talks about the unsaved and he talks about the winnowing. Okay. So notice again, the saved and the unsaved both will experience fire. The Bible says every knee will bow, folks. For all the people who don't want to bow now to Jesus, you will have to bow. If you, you don't want to bow and serve him as God or think that he's just one of many other gods in many ways, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess because there is only one God. Praise God. And his name is Jesus. All right. John was not a welcome figure to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? So uh, 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 the, the Sadducees controlled the temple, the Pharisees controlled the synagogue. So remember, they had mikvahs, baths at the temple, okay? So all these Pharisees and Sadducees, they would undertake these baths at the temple. 
But John was an unwelcome figure. He's this weird guy eating honey and locusts and dressed like uh, uh, some wild man in the, in, the, in the desert. So John baptized in the Jordan River. His baptism was about repenting from sins. His immersion had less to do with purification. We covered that. Okay? So all who were sorry for offending God and they no longer wanted to sin, but rather wanted to turn to God, would be baptized. That is the purpose of baptism. Okay? So here comes Jesus, right? And uh, when he talks about Jesus coming to be baptized, okay, uh, understand that Jesus, he was now, uh, he was probably really roughly around 29 years old. Um, but he was about, the scripture says he was, he, was, he was about 30. He was beginning to become, going into his 30th year. So he had lived for these 29 years, right? But he was about to enter into ministry. So it was, it, it, he was now declaring himself as ready to commit to his assignment. Please understand that, okay? The reason that Jesus was being baptized, remember, Jews underwent mikvah baths for all different types of purposes. When uh, uh, at 30 years old, one would enter into the priesthood at 30 years old, and of course, it would involve uh, being, being washing in the, bath, in, in, in the bath. So just as how the sinner would come for baptism as a sign that he was willing, ready to serve God, right? Jesus had no sin, but yet... He says, to fulfill all righteousness, I am now ready to commit my life to my assignment. See, understand that. That is the purpose of Jesus coming. Now, why the dove and why, why did, did, did there need to be this heavenly vision? Because all the people were looking to John. Remember, they thought John was Elijah. Okay, so here to contrast Jesus with John God wants everybody around. See, the sign of the dove was not for John and it wasn't for Jesus. The sign of the spirit descending like a dove was for the people around them. Okay? That Jesus is supreme above John. That was the purpose. Okay? So, you know, again, you got to understand that these people were following John in so much that when you get to Acts 19... The Bible talks about in Ephesus where uh, Paul having passed to the upper, upper coast, right? He met uh, some disciples of John and he asked them, you know, you know, have you received the Holy Ghost? They said, we haven't heard of it. So some 30 years later, right? We still have disciples of John. There, there was so much allegiance to John that there was even dispute between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. The Bible talks about Jesus and his disciples baptizing in one place and John baptizing in another place, right? And John even sent disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? So there was this uncertainty. So the whole purpose of the dove was to let the people know who he really was, okay? So were these disciples of John saved? if they were trusting only in John's baptism? No. Otherwise, Paul would not tell them in Acts chapter 19 to be rebaptized in Jesus' name. So again, for those people who want to suggest that it's purely repentance alone and God's grace that saves us, well, it goes completely contrary to what the book of Acts teaches because John's baptism did not save anybody. John baptized unto repentance, but he says, guess what? There's one coming after me. Look to him, turn to him, and guess what? He will baptize you with the saving power of his Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of Christ, as I said, you don't belong to him. Praise God. Let's jump to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 says, Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tended of the devil, and he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. And when the tempter came, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him to, a holy, to the holy city, sit him on the temple, and said, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, 
lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said, it's written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil take him to an exceeding high mountain and show him all the kingdom of the world and the glory of them and said, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus to him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaves him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came to Capernaum uh, uh, and uh, he says that it might be fulfilled by Isaiah, right? Uh, and uh, let's go on down, verse 18. Then Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting nets, and he called them. Then he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his, and his brother John, and he called them. Verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick folk that were taken with divers disease and torments, and those who were possessed with devils, those who were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and he healed them. And they there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. All right. Now, notice first and foremost, it says, then Jesus was led up of the Spirit. It is the Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness, okay, for this encounter with the devil, all right? So a lot of times we encounter tests in our lives and we want to immediately blame the devil, but understand that the devil is only an agent that God allows in your life to test you and prove you. Many times it's the Holy Spirit that leads you, right, into the test. Not into temptation, but into the test. Now, the word devil comes from a word diabolos. Diabolos, okay? And it's translation from the term Satan. It means adversary, okay? Adversary, that's what it means. Okay, he, he, he represents the arch enemy of God, the devil, the Satan, uh, evil one, adversary, others. They, they, it all means the same thing, right? Uh, uh, it means uh, the adversary, right? Uh, and, and it's not his name, folks. Okay, so the devil or the Satan. Satan is not his name. It, it simply means... Uh, adversary. Sometimes we can forget that Satan, like all other beings or objects, was created by God, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, Satan is not equal to God in power, all right? Now, notice that with the three temptations, Jesus quotes scripture, right? And guess what? Where does Jesus quote from? The book we just came from, Deuteronomy. All the scriptures that Jesus spoke to Satan, to the Satan, was from Deuteronomy 6 and 8. Why? Because Matthew is again showing Jesus as a second type of Moses, right? Now, why is Jesus in the wilderness? Because Jesus is echoing Israel's experience in the wilderness, the Exodus. I want you to see that, okay? Uh, this, 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 uh, you know, I, I, again, I speak to some theologians and they don't get this. The word is, the name Israel, as I've said before, it can speak of a man, Jacob, or a nation. Okay? So, while we studied the nation of Israel in, in the wilderness, right, God calls them, plural, his son. <laughs> One. See? You know, uh, it's important to see that. That sometimes... An individual represents a people, okay? Or a people represents an individual, right? So Jesus here is representative of all Israel because he is placed in the same environment that Israel was in. And how long was Israel there? 40 years, see? How long was Jesus in the wilderness? 40 days, see? So the 40 days of Jesus' fasting represents the 40 years of of Israel in the wilderness, okay? So in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, it says, 
Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, it says, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart. See? And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. See? We skipped it. We missed that. So the Spirit led Jesus in the wilderness to hunger. Just like how God led Israel into the wilderness to experience hunger. Why? To prove and to test them. Okay? So God led the Israelites through the desert. He did it intentionally to achieve a specific purpose. To teach them through testing and humbling. Right? God wanted to see what was in the recesses of their hearts. Right? Because it's when you are tested that the real you comes out. So one of the humbling experiences they faced was they became hungry and thirsty. And God's purpose for them was to teach them that God doesn't, that, that, that man does not live by bread alone, right? God wanted to teach them that he, God, could sustain them. So here Jesus, the second Moses, right, goes through 40 days, right, fasting and, and, and nights, just like even Moses himself, fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He endured similar trials. But guess what? Israel murmured. Israel failed. But Jesus overcame. Wow. I could spend time on that. What the devil did towards Jesus, he does to us all. Okay? He's going to test us. He tempt us. God allows Satan to test us. At our weakest and most unexpected moments, Satan tempts us to go against God. And Jesus gave us the formula for resisting Satan, right? And that is to what? Use the word of God. So that's why every Christian who is not trying to get deep in your word and learn the word, you're going to have a difficult time when Satan comes, right? So again, Matthew is making this connection between Moses and Christ. So the devil has an easy solution. He says, he says, turn these stones to bread. If thou be the son of God. How many times the Satan, the, the Satan comes at us? If you really love Jesus, why would he let you go through this? If Jesus really loves you, why would he allow you to go through this? Right? Okay. If you're really saved, why? You know, Satan is always coming at us with these if questions. Okay. But Jesus used the word. Next in verse 5, he takes Jesus to the temple. Right? Notice it was God who took Jesus to the desert, to the wilderness. But it was Satan who took him to the temple. Right? For testing. Right? He takes him to the pinnacle and tries to sow seeds of doubt. If you're the son of God, go ahead and jump. And guess what? He even quotes scripture. Satan knows his Bible. That's why you need to know your Bible because Satan knows. Some of us, Satan don't even have to mess with you because he knows you don't know your Bible and you're just going to sin because of your ignorance. Okay? Right? Satan is just going to leave you alone because you, you say you're a Christian but you're living in sin, don't even know you're sinning because you don't know the word. Right? But here he comes to the word with the word. The devil has God. Okay? He quotes the scripture. Right? And that's Psalm 91 that he quotes. Jesus rebukes him and, and again quotes Deuteronomy 6. So Jesus is giving scripture for scripture. You're coming with scripture, Satan? I got scriptures for you. That's how we need to uh, 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 fight and resist the enemy. Verse 8, the, uh, the Satan leads Jesus to a high place, higher than the temple, to a mountaintop to show him the world. Right? And in the ascending geography, there is the ascending temptation. He offers Christ the world that he lays out before him. And he says he has the ability to give it to him. Imagine that. <laughs> Satan who thinks he knows the word. See, that's the, a lot of folks think they know the word, but they're confused. Because Jesus created the world. How could Satan, who was created by Jesus, 
as God <laughs> come to offer God what belongs to him. See the ridiculousness of the situation. But when you know who you are and you know the word of God, that's what enables you to resist the devil. Okay. So he quotes the scriptures again from Deuteronomy 6. Right. Then the Bible says, then he leaves him alone. Wow. At that moment, Satan's hopes are crushed. The testing is over. There's nothing left. He has failed. Praise God. Right? Now notice, what was the first temptation that Satan came with? Food. The belly. Okay? And guess what? It's the same thing that Satan came at Adam and Eve with. Notice that? Okay? Food. It's no coincidence that Jesus and Adam were tempted with food. Food is a powerful fleshly need okay that's why you have to di discipline and train yourself to fast okay because satan understands praise god that if you're a glutton and if you're greedy and if you're giving in to all the to, to, to the fleshly desire just to eat just to eat not for nutrition but just to eat he knows that you become a victim of your flesh okay so in adam's case there was an abundance of food and still Adam fell. Imagine that. Abundance of food. All the trees in the garden he could eat from except one. It wasn't a lack of food. Abundance of food. And yet Adam fell. And here Christ, it was a lack of food. See? All right? So notice how the temptations came. First, the temptation was for Jesus and his own flesh. Right? Right? Cast these stones down, uh, uh, turn these stones to bread. Next, it was the temple, right? To go above what God's word says, right? Then it was the world, okay? The kingdoms of the world, right? So the, Satan ascends in his temptation. Verse 14, he moves to Capernaum and he does that what? Just to fulfill a prophecy. Look at that, folks. Jesus moved to an address just to fulfill a prophecy. <laughs> Imagine that. How many of us will allow our lives to be ordered, right? Just so that God's word can be fulfilled in us. I, I, could, I could go off on this, all right? Jesus changed location, not because there was a nice house with a jacuzzi and a pool in the backyard, not because there was a better job offering and a promotion there, just to fulfill God's word. Oh, we could talk about that in chat. Verse 17. Uh, uh, um, Jesus began his ministry with what? The same words of John the Baptist, right? Repent, right? The words are not what Jesus... These words are not what Jesus will speak when he comes back, folks. Folks, this opportunity for repentance, this message of the kingdom, all right? Again, it is a gradual, it's, it, 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 it unfolds in stages. So when Jesus comes, the next time it won't be repentance. It will be wrath and vengeance, right? Because it will be the next phase of the kingdom. We're in the phase of the kingdom now for repentance and remission of sins and receiving the fire of God to transform us on the inside. That is the phase of the kingdom we are in. But the next phase of the kingdom that Jesus himself is going to usher in, okay, is when, 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 when God begins to pour out his wrath. So first is salvation and then comes judgment, okay? So therefore, the message is that God's kingdom on earth has just been inaugurated through John and you can only gain membership through sincere repentance, because it's not a place and it's not a specific period in time. It represents God's rule in the lives of his people, right? So if you are born again, the kingdom of God is already within you. And I recommend everybody under the sound of my voice, right? You must be, but marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again, okay? So the kingdom of God is spiritual right now. It's in us. We speak in tongues and we are growing in Christ and we are putting off malice. We are putting off hatred. We're putting, I hope we are, because that's the evidence of the kingdom in us. 
Don't, don't rely simply on the speaking in tongues. It's gradual. It's a mustard tree growing. It is a stone filling the earth. So the kingdom of God should be growing in us. Oh my good, I'm getting pre God, I'm getting preachy. All right. So it's spiritual in nature. And in time, it will transform and not only be spiritual, but it will have a physical condition in the new heaven and the new earth. So the kingdom of God is both present and future, okay? It doesn't belong to any specific moment in time. Verse 18, Jesus begins his ministry. He calls these fishermen, these disciples, and uh, we, we're not going to get into Peter and his name. I got notes on that, but let's get to verse 23. Jesus went around speaking in synagogues because they were those were the common places where Jews fellowship, right? But he did what? He healed the sick, right? And he preached the gospel. Now, Jesus wasn't preaching the gospel as we know it today, folks. Jesus wasn't saying, hey, guys, believe in me because I'm going to die for your sins and you will be saved. <laughs> That's not what Jesus was preaching. That's not the gospel he was preaching, okay? The preaching of the good news to them meant that the time would come, is, is here, right, for God's deliverance, right? It was time for them to repent, right? And in again, they were thinking about deliverance from Roman oppression. When I taught you in Romans about, uh, Paul said, the gospel of God, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. We need to understand those in their different phases, right? Jesus did not tell everybody at that moment who he was. Right for many for many years, even his own disciples didn't fully understand who he was. Okay, so Jesus was gradually going to reveal the kingdom to them. Ultimately, when he died on the cross, then they fully got it, and we understand it the way we do today. But he would heal the sick, he would perform miracles, he would preach the kingdom, and people would come to him, and this would prepare them now. For what we're going to study next week, which is the Sermon on the Mount, which we just finished in Deuteronomy, the Sermon on the Mount that Moses, Moses, did, Moses did in Moab, right? And so, again, short time, a lot of information. Please, if you have not yet subscribed to this channel, please do so. Invite your friends. A lot of information that are here, but guess what? That is here, but guess what? I have a lot more information. It's just time. So, Type questions in the chat. Leave comments. Let's dialogue. Let's have a conversation. All right. Let's th let this be your platform, your medium, so that we can all grow and learn together because the kingdom of God, it is here. And now is the time for us to accept it. Until next time, God bless. Praise God.